Throughout much of history, and particularly during the Napoleonic Wars of the early 19th century, one of the most honorable posts that a man could hold was to be in the cavalry. Across borders and cultures, they maintained an almost universal mystique, shrouded in glory, zeal, honor, dignity, and, of course, martial prowess. But the name itself, cavalry, is rather vague, isn't it? A cavalry, like artillery or infantry, is not a specific kind of soldier. Rather, during the Napoleonic Wars, it represented a much wider category of military service. You didn't just join the cavalry, you joined a specific regiment of horse, which might have any number of a wide range of possible names, honorifics, titles, and distinctions. The most common of these types were the cuirassiers, dragoons, hussars, and lancers. There were, of course, many variants, like the carabiners or ulans, that sort of thing, uh, and many of these were still further distinguished by titles of heavy or light. When discussing military history from this period, these terms are thrown around an awful lot, and it's very easy to get confused by it all. And to make matters even worse, as we'll soon discover, sometimes the name of a unit doesn't even match its actual role on the battlefield. It all makes understanding the role of the cavalry just a little bit confusing. So in this video, the subject of which has been voted on by my ever generous and ever patient supporters on Patreon.com, we're going to talk about this strange web of terminology and go through some of the most common types, quote unquote, of cavalry during the Napoleonic Wars who they were, what they did, and how they did it. Uh, but before we do get started, again, it's very important to stress the idea that there are very few historical military terms with set definitions across the board, and this is particularly true in today's subject. What I'm offering is a broad and sweeping generalization regarding the different kinds of cavalry, and there are always going to be exceptions to the rules that I put forward here and we'll go over how and why those kinds of differences and exceptions arise a little bit later on in the video. But for now, let's get started with possibly the most iconic kind of cavalry during the Napoleonic Wars, the cuirassier, or as I've also heard it pronounced as cuirassier, uh, depending largely on exactly how French you want to get when you talk about this, the cuirass, the primary piece of armor worn by the cuirassier. They were most notably used by the French Empire under Napoleon, but most other countries also used similarly armored cavalry in at least some respect, uh, with most nations giving at least some of their cavalry breastplates for some duration of the wars. Uh, they fell in and out of fashion a lot during periods of conflict really throughout the 18th and 19th century, let alone in the Napoleonic Wars, uh, with nations giving cavalrymen armor for some campaigns, removing it for other, changing the designs, Again, all for reasons that we'll get into. Cuirassiers and other units like them were armored, heavy cavalry, and they usually took on the role of shock troops, which is what heavy cavalry normally does on a battlefield. They rode together in large blocks. They applied extreme and condensed pressure at specific points in an enemy's line with the intention of breaking apart and scattering enemy formations. Cuirassier regiments were often given the most veteran troops and the strongest troops alongside the largest and strongest horses. They fielded in this way a literal weight larger than most other units could compete with, and there was very little that could withstand the brunt of their full charge. And unlike certain other kinds of troops, they were able to hold their own against both enemy infantry and enemy cavalry, largely due to their equipment. Naturally, the most significant piece of that equipment being the breastplate, the most iconic piece by far. Now, a lot of people still go back and forth on exactly how effective this armor was during the Napoleonic Wars. And in all fairness, its contemporaries were doing the exact same thing. And across Europe, the efficiency of this armor was always questioned, and as such, the use of it always varied. Though on the part of the French, Napoleon was quite convinced of their value, and he dramatically expanded their use as a result. Now, theoretically, these breastplates were proofed against musket shot. That means that on paper, at least, they would only ever be sent out for service if they were capable of stopping a musket ball, potentially even at close range. In practice, however, their performance understandably would vary an awful lot on a wide variety of conditions. These included the range at which the enemy shot was fired, 
the caliber of the ball, the amount of and the quality of the powder that was used to propel that shot, whether it was a dead-on shot or if it struck the armor at an angle, and then of course as well the actual quality of the armor itself, whether it met the official standards or if the armor was cutting a few corners, maybe a few rubber stamps involved, if you catch my drift. Now again, broadly speaking, these breastplates could indeed stop musketry at longer ranges, and pistols even closer, of course, uh, but once you did get in really close, I'm afraid I can't give you an exact figure on that exact range, again it would vary an awful lot I'm sure, uh, your average musket could potentially punch a hole right through the armor. And a lot of that would again depend on the angle at which the shot hit, as you may imagine. You'll find examples in museums all over the place, some of them with dents and dings from where musketry bounced off of the plate, uh, some where rounds have embedded themselves inside of the plate, and others where, well, the rider wasn't so lucky, and again, maybe you got that direct shot at close range and it punched a hole right through the thing. And I think that this is one of the biggest reasons why people today still can't agree on whether or not this armor was very effective. Not only were they disagreeing historically, so the primary sources are all over the place, uh, but it's going to vary an awful lot on a case-by-case -case basis. Of course, the armor wasn't terribly useful against cannon shot in really any circumstance, again, as you may imagine. Of course, the true value of that armor would come not when the cuirassiers were closing into the enemy, but rather when they met their foes in melee combat. There it might protect them against bayonet, pike, saber, and lance. And similarly, the cuirassiers would often have a helmet on their head to protect from exactly the same. However, not everything was perfect, and the heavy armor was not without its problems, especially on the campaign, and particularly during summer, when it was much hotter to wear and more difficult to transport than the simple wool coats that men would wear underneath them. And while it may save your life in a battle, a soldier in the early 19th century was far more likely to die of problems from heat and dehydration, exhaustion, disease, infection, general sickness, than he ever was to die of enemy action. And of course, those large, finely crafted plates of steel were also very expensive to produce, particularly on a large scale, and many nations just didn't have the infrastructure to raise and maintain these large units of very heavy cavalry. These drawbacks were the primary reasons why not every nation was always employing full plate armor for all of their soldiers. Not because they didn't work in the battlefield, but because of matters of economy, difficulties on campaign, those larger scale issues that surround those battles. Again, most of a military campaign is not the battle itself, but the preparation getting to that point. This would lead some nations, like Austria for example, to experiment with lighter versions of the cuirassiers, uh, doing things like removing their back armor, but keeping the front armor, so that way you have the armor where it theoretically matters most on the charge and whatnot, uh, but you're able to cut down dramatically on the cost and those difficulties in maintaining the equipment. Across the board, cuirassier units and other more general types of heavy cavalry, whether they had breastplates or only just helmets, uh, they would usually carry heavy sabers or swords as their primary weapon, and they might also have pistols or even sometimes carbines with them as well. Again, across Europe you'll find an awful lot of variants. And that does lead us into a little bit of a crossover, because cuirassiers weren't necessarily the only kind of cavalry to wear armor. They were just the more common kind. For example, Napoleon also employed his carabiners a cheval, carabiners who, at least for some of their history, also wore armor much like the cuirassiers. So what exactly is a carabiner? Well, a little more straightforward, they are cavalrymen who were armed not only with melee weapons, again usually sabers or swords, but also with carbines. A carbine is effectively just a smaller musket, it's a shorter and lighter version of the standard infantry weapon. It's easier to handle, particularly on horseback, and is able to be both loaded and fired from the saddle. During peacetime, carabiners were often used in a policing capacity, capable of not only controlling large crowds, but also of patrolling things like the countryside, roadways, and borders. During periods of war, however, their specific armaments meant that you could have a highly mobile force on the battlefield with significant force projection outside of melee combat. 
And that equipment lends itself to a lighter kind of soldier, a lighter skirmishing order, uh, where they emphasize hit and run tactics. Ride in, shoot at the enemy, and then pull back before they can charge against you because you have those lighter and faster horses. Alongside their carbines and sabers, they might also have one or more pistols on them as well. Again, there are always exceptions, and sometimes carabiner regiments were ordered to emphasize their sabers over their carbines and act more as heavy cavalry, charging in towards enemy units as opposed to light cavalry only skirmishing with those units. In the case I mentioned earlier, the carabiner a cheval, well, those troops were armored and in many circumstances were acted more like cuirassiers on the battlefield. Another interesting example, we have the British 6th Dragoon Guards, who were also called the Carabiners. So, is a Carabiner the same as a Dragoon, just with a different name? After all, we do have a British unit here with both of the names. Well, not necessarily. Their role was very similar to that of the Dragoon, who were also cavalrymen who generally wore little to no armor and carried firearms. Unlike carabiners, however, the role of the Dragoon wasn't necessarily to act as mounted infantry, but rather to serve as mounted infantry. What I mean is that in their earlier history, Dragoons would ride to their objective, dismount from their horses, and then operate as regular infantry at a forward position. Uh, they might skirmish with an enemy, uh, ride out, hold a position, uh, test an enemy's strength, then mount back up and ride off before they could be met with significant force. They might also act as scouts and pickets for the army. These kinds of tactics were actually very popular in the later 19th century with colonial armies in places like Africa employing these rapid-moving mounted infantry units. Though during the Napoleonic Wars specifically, their battlefield employment was much more limited and they often just served again as a more generic cavalry unit, emphasizing their swords and the charge over their firearms and skirmishing. Those dragoons who were thus employed were often termed heavy dragoons, and in this way they were functionally not terribly dissimilar to the cuirassiers. They just didn't wear breastplates, although some of them may have even had helmets. The distinction was, at least for many units during the Napoleonic Wars, primarily just in the name. However, light dragoons might continue their more auxiliary level operations of scouting and the like. And in that way, light dragoons, as more traditional mounted infantry, uh, operated very similarly to hussars. And indeed, many light dragoons were often rebranded during this period as hussars. That's what the British did. They had a series of light dragoon regiments that they later termed as hussars in a more foreign style. Hussars were the lightest form of cavalry during this time period. Like dragoons and carabiners, they aren't wearing any armor, and they might carry firearms at times, uh, but those weren't the primary weapons. And again, I must stress during this time period, because look a little bit earlier to the 16th century, and you have men riding around like this in Poland and Lithuania, who are also called hussars, but they obviously served a very different role on the battlefield than the Napoleonic Western-style hussars that we're about to talk about. Uh, incidentally, if you don't know, these guys are called the Winged Hussars, and they have such a disproportionate base of obsessed fans you'd think that they were German. Anyways, while other forms of cavalry might emphasize size and strength in their mounts, Hussar regiments usually sought after the fastest and most agile horses, potentially the smaller horses as a result. Their clothing, when compared to the rest of the military, was usually very exotic and inspired by foreign dress coming out of Central and Eastern Europe from people such as the Hungarians, and that is where the tradition of the Hussar is really coming from. They were among the first military units, in fact, in the modern Western tradition to popularize longer facial hair, particularly mustaches. As you may be aware, they had a distinctive reputation among the cavalry for being dashing and passionate young men, uh, for better or worse. Uh, the better may come from not only their romantic style of dress, but also from their military role as light cavalry. These are men who emphasize speed and maneuverability over power projection, like those more heavy-handed cuirassiers. They acted as scouts and pickets for the army, searching for enemies and testing out the terrain ahead as the most forward units of their respective armies. As such, they might land themselves in hot water quite a few times, coming across enemy positions that are far more powerful than themselves, requiring those dashing hussars to beat a hasty retreat to a more secure post. The negative aspects of being more passionate soldiers, however, may also come from a very similar place. 
as those scouts and pickets for the army, hussars often represented the first enemy soldiers that a native population would see and interact with as they passed through towns and villages. Passion may easily translate to cruelty, after all, and particularly when you're in a territory which is hostile to you and when your main army is still well behind. Unlike the Dragoons and Carabiners, Hussars often maintained their distinctive role in the battlefield as light cavalry. They aren't being ordered to charge enemy formations as a kind of shock troop like heavy cavalry unless that enemy has already broken up or they're fleeing or if they're in a particularly exposed position. You might use them to do something like, say, seize some enemy guns which are exposed and not under traditional infantry or cavalry protection. Uh, like, say, those ones over there. Wait, wait, no, no, not those guns. The, the other one. No, go, go right. Uh, oh, oh, heavens! They're not going to stop, are they? Oh, yes. You can see there are indeed some disadvantages to being the fastest men in your army. Well, we'll come back to them later on, I suppose. In any case, uh, the last category that, we, that I want to talk about, uh, we of course have the lancers. Uh, probably the most obvious to tell by their name alone, these were cavalrymen who carried lances. And this also makes them much more distinctive from the other types of cavalry that we've discussed so far, who emphasized sabers and swords in melee combat. Uh, as you can expect, this would give the lancers an excellent advantage when they're on the charge. Whether they're facing infantry or cavalry, a nine-foot lance atop a horse will give its wielder an awful lot more reach than a bayonet or a saber ever will. Particularly if they're going up against an armored cavalry unit, they'll want to put as much force behind the driving point of that lance as possible. Or, if they're facing enemy infantry in a dense square formation, having the ability to thrust beyond that bristling wall of bayonets may well save your attack from disaster. So why then were the other kinds of cavalry, particularly the cuirassiers, not given lances? Well, they weren't without their disadvantages as well, or at the very least, their perceived disadvantages. While there's little that can beat a lance on the charge, once you get into the thick of a melee, it was thought that lances were too unwieldy to be effective against a saber or a sword. On a heavy charge, it's also very possible that a lance breaks after the initial contact, requiring a sidearm of sorts anyways. Again, whether or not the balance between reach and being unwieldy in close quarters was a valid concern, I really can't say. I'm not qualified in that way. I have little to no experience in European martial arts of that kind of debate. Uh, I would recommend instead that you ask Mr. Matt Easton of Scala Gladiatoria for that kind of thing. Uh, but leading up to the Napoleonic Wars, this was at least the perceived concern among many militaries, and it's one of the reasons why not every kind of cavalry was issued with lances as well as their swords. Though it is noteworthy that during the Napoleonic Wars, lancers did see immense use and were found to be highly practical in a wide variety of circumstances. You may also hear the term Ulan thrown around an awful lot in relation to men like this. The Ulans were lancers specifically recruited from Polish and Lithuanian populations, and they were very popular in a number of militaries of states which occupied that land, uh, including, of course, the Russian, the Austrian, and the Prussian empires. The French, too, utilized a significant number of Polish lancers in their armies. Although, again, the reasons why the Poles and Lithuanians were perceived as being more capable with a lance and the Western Europeans as preferring the swords and sabers, uh, that, again, is a much more complicated subject that I don't really have the time to get into today. And again, that perceived weakness may well give us something of a lens into why, during the 18th and 19th centuries, these lancer cavalry were slowly shifting from being heavy cavalry into having a more light cavalry type role. Again, if the role of heavy cavalry is to get in close with an enemy and fight them in melee combat, if the lance is perceived to be unwieldy in melee combat, well, you can see why they might only give them to the lighter cavalry, and lancers might be used more to chase down fleeing enemies, where again that longer reach will allow you to spear them from a safe distance, not allowing the enemy to turn around and fight back against you. But again, with that we're dealing more with perception than anything else. There are always a lot of exceptions when it comes to issues of perception, and it's very, very difficult to nail that kind of thing down. That's just sort of my impression as to why the lance may have been used more by unarmored cavalry, lighter cavalry, as opposed to by heavy cavalry units.
Again, if those individuals who are more inclined to historical European martial arts can lend some insight into exactly why these distinctions were made and the value of the lance versus the saber and all those sorts of issues, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. I'll keep an eye out for that in the comments down below. But there we have, again, very broadly speaking, the four primary or most popular types, quote unquote, of cavalry during the Napoleonic Wars. Cuirassiers, Dragoons, Lancers, and Hussars, going in a kind of general order from heaviest to lightest in a way. Uh, but again, it's very, very, very important to stress that this is by no means an exhaustive or categorical list. There was no central planning committee for the cavalry of Europe, and there is no truly unified naming system for these militaries. There are only common conventions, trends, and themes. Indeed, some units don't fit into any of these categories I listed above at all. Now, at the end of it all, I find myself thinking more and more about those British heavy cavalry units like the Life Guards. They were household cavalry troops, they wore helmets, carried heavy cavalry sabers and swords, but otherwise went completely without armor. So are those men cuirassiers? I mean, kind of? But there's nothing in their actual name designation to indicate that. So if they are, they were cuirassiers by purpose, being, you know, that very heavy, kind of sort of armored cavalry, but not cuirassiers by name. And similarly, you can have men who are cuirassiers by name, but probably not by function on the battlefield. It all depends exactly on how you define these categories and where you draw those parameters. See, a big part of all of this is coming from the conventions of military naming and how heavily those conventions can be based off of tradition and precedence rather than outright practicality. Just because a unit is formed to be one kind of cavalry doesn't mean that their role doesn't change in the future. What was once a light cavalry regiment may need to be changed in an army reorganization at some point into a heavy regiment. A unit of hussars might be given carbines, effectively turning them into carabiners, or kind of sort of like light dragoons. Sometimes these changes are temporary, for a particular campaign or a single war, and then they revert at the end of the conflict to their original state. But other times the change might prove so successful that they make it a permanent one. But just because the task of the unit changes, doesn't necessarily mean that the name itself changes. Sometimes the name changes are late. Sometimes they never happen at all. Sometimes names have a particular feeling or an aesthetic attached to them, or even an outright honorific that its men and its officers are very keen to keep and maintain. If we want to draw an example from the infantry in the British army during the Napoleonic Wars, there is no functional difference between a fusilier and any other kind of infantry soldier. So why give them a name distinction? Because of the tradition. The first foot guards haven't been throwing grenades for ages, so why are we calling them the grenadier guards? Because of the tradition. It can be the exact same way with cavalry. That's why we have dragoons acting like cuirassiers, or carabiners acting like hussars. And that's why you shouldn't ever dare walk into horse guards today and talk about the British cuirassiers. Because sure, they may look exactly like them, they're exactly outfitted according to the category as cuirassiers, but don't you dare give them such a French name as all of that. So remember, everyone, the next time you're commanding an army on the fields of Europe and one of your officers runs up and warns you that the French carabiners are countercharging your cuirassiers, well, they may have a better shot at it than you'd think. Make sure that you know your enemy well and not just the broad categories to which their men may or may not actually belong. Thank you all for watching, of course, in particular to my ever-beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com, for it is by virtue of your support that I am able to carry on making videos exactly like this one. And of course, to all of you, my dear viewers, until the next time, I am, and I shall remain, your most humble and obedient of servants.